It's sort of similar to what Paul sort of said, that I think a, a certain material at a certain time um, appears to be right for you. And that, that's sort of very much kind of like the clay. Um, I, I don't think I've, I found clay, I think clay found me in a way, because I was rather fighting against it. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a shame that my father's not here because my dad actually brought us up to make pottery in the back, sort of like garage. So he used to go into evening classes and doing things like that. And then he would tell us to sort of like make sort of like pots, you know, you know, on the weekends and especially for birthdays, and especially for Christmases. And I suppose as a young, young kid, you sort of had a bit of an adversity to that because, you know, <laughs> did, did you really want to do that all the time? <laughs> you know, you wanted to get out and sort of kick around and do something rebellious. And it was like Dad was saying, like, make some, make some art. Um, and that was, that was sort of rather difficult. Always really, really handy with a crayon, but sort of like to get my hands around clay was rather kind of like difficult. So when I went to art school, I wanted to become a famous painter. And I realised sort of like after a while from my tutors that I wasn't going to become a famous painter because they sort of said, no, I think you're going to, you should be a graphic designer. Um, and my, my heart fell at that sort of like <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> There was no choice. So I, um, I tried lots of different things. I realised that I was into sort of like 3D and 3D sort of like seemed to be good. Um, so if I couldn't be a painter, I could be a sculptor. But I tried kind of like wood, um, which was slow. I tried stone, which was harder, and metal was almost impossible. So it was one day when I just like picked up the clay, which was the last thing to do, and just things just fell into my hands and things just happened. And it was a bit like there it was. It was telling me, you know, here I am, this is, this is your material. So after that, that's, that's, that's what I predominantly did. And I carried on sort of like throwing, I, I, I discovered throwing on the wheel. And it seemed fascinating to me because I could just make these kind of like huge, large things very quick. And they appeared to me to be sort of like canvases. So it kind of like paralleled really with this idea of wanting to become a painter. And I could put loads and loads and loads of glazes on all of these kind of like big bowls. And they just came out of the kiln looking fantastic. And it was, a, it was a, an idea really where I think that this, this idea of abstract expressionism, that you sort of like, you do things very spontaneously. And it was sort of like, it interested me. It was something else which I discovered. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know there were people called abstract expressionists at the time. It was just that there was these, these processes which were immediate, very fast, very revealing. So I started getting more and more into it. And I, I, I went there, there, therefore, through, through education, I discovered various bits and pieces. But that's sort of like, sort of like, I've arrived at a material, and this material then is just... Um, behaves kind of like really quite mysteriously to me a lot of the time and I would say that I can't really do without it any longer so that it sort of becomes part of your identity um, touching making not thinking a lot of the time where you sort of get mesmerized by the material and you just flow into what you're actually doing it becomes part of kind of like I suppose your your sort of like your being and in this sense also what's important to me Elsewhere is usually uh, this idea of getting out into the landscape and walking and just like being. So inevitably it was going to be landscape which also, you know, inspires me massively and, and feeds a lot of ideas. So getting out and, and walking through landscape. The other area also is that um, the interaction with sort of clay and how I feel about that is sometimes very similar to when I interact with people. Um, and those, those interesting moments where you have these exchanges with people, you, you, you touch kind of like very like minds, and it's got quite a rarity, I feel. And the, the area there which kind of like clay sort of like fulfills is that also that, you know, these, these objects um, also interact, and they interact in a very sort of like human way, that, you know, you come together and you, you, you drink together, or you all drink together. Um, you, you know, you have parties and you eat together and all of these things, they provide a function which enhances that sort of like that connection. So it seems like a, a, another link that sort of, you know, being in the landscape and that sort of like f f feeding me, having a sense of belonging. Um, we've also sort of like the interaction with people with the clay feeding that sort of idea also. So it seems sort of uncanny really that it sort of like fulfills a lot of areas inside of myself. So when I'm out and about, um, I, I quite often think, I think sort of, um, 
I, I, I pick up subliminal sort of like things within the landscapes where I walk. And, you know, these things can be either objects or otherwise they're sort of like they're, they're sort of uh, patterns or formations within, in, within landscapes. And these things then sort of like they, they sort of feed certain ideas. So the big plaques here or the big plates, um, they, they don't actually have a permanent name. I keep on re renaming them in many different ways. Uh, but these large slabs are landscape paintings. So they sort of like where, where I'm walking through, sort of like the landscape, the certain slope of the land, um, the certain weathers which are coming in, because I, 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 I love walking in all sorts of weathers, especially usually when it's, there's, a, there's a certain hardship to it, I think. Um, I, I traverse up hills, walking sideways up hills, get to the top, and as soon as I get to the top, I don't spend much time on the top, and I go down again. So I, I'm, I'm wandering quite a lot of the time over the weekends and, and, and that with the dogs. And the dogs are good, good for that. <laughs> they need taking places. So these are really kind of like mimicking that sort of like idea. Um, also the idea of being on the land, you know, and what you're walking upon is quite often this material. So I, I, I sort of source indigenous materials also. So sort of like stones and grits and clays, which then I sort of take home and I mix into my clays and they become part of what you actually see. So, yeah, various, various, these various forms. The, the, the other area then which I'm quite interested in is the sort of objects which I see within the landscapes. And these um, don't, don't pay, they're, they're, they're not sort of like my main sort of like focus at the problem, the predominant sort of like moment. Um, I think this is, I think this is kind of like trying to replicate kind of like landscapes or actually sort of like, you know, uh, giving a sense, giving an abstract sense of what I'm seeing. But, but previously, probably going back now about sort of four years, I was quite interested in the, the objects in which you see in, in, in the windows and which is over on the other side. And they, they tend to start to, these objects which I was actually seeing, start to become more sort of metaphoric, kind of have metaphoric messages within them. And... Um, so the sort of like the tower, which actually everyone, everyone always calls it the tower, but it wasn't the tower originally. It was actually, um, I, I sort of called it sort of, um, it, it was about a wood burner, really. And it was about the idea of sort of like fires, and that we all gather around fires, and we all sort of like, you know, we tell stories around fires, we actually have good times around fires. You know, it's a, it's a necessity also in life. So they were originally developed out of that sort of idea, is everybody else called them. Towers, you know, but I suppose I always got very interested a long time ago, and there were sort of ideas which I actually had about, um, sort of got us quite interested in Greek mythology and just sort of certain stories, and um, uh, again, the idea of whether or not they how true they really were, and looking into that a little bit. So, on top of the um. Of, of, the, of the tower in particular, there's sort of like a little sort of shrine, the idea of the shrine, the shrine of well-being. So these things, uh, they, they would show up also within that sort of like context. Um, and also the, the larger form down here, which is called table, and it is literally here, sort of presentation, sort of like, um, sort of slab here, where you see these, um, these, these medium sort of like cups on. But so the table also came from the idea that we, we eat and drink around the table. Yeah, and we sort of fall over and crawl under the table in the best sort of sense of the ways and at some parties anyway. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was quite interested in that sort of thing. And um, it, it's not really obvious in this because this it, didn't, it was one of those ex, um, experiments which didn't work very well. But um, seeing things within the landscape, one particular thing, you know, lots of leaves within autumn, the, the, the singular leaves. And so I started to sort of like printing down and, and also, sort of like, probably to Paul's sort of um, surprise and also gleam, that there were screen prints kind of like placed on these, um, of photographs which I'd actually seen of, of certain, certain leaves. And the first experiments didn't really work, and then I had to actually print on top and then actually press in sort of um, shapes and patterns. And so the blob bits are actually the glaze which are filling the, in, the, the, the presses. And so that, that, was, that was an idea which, again, I don't think never worked very well. So that's, an, that's another thing which is on the back burner. Um, and I think 
like a lot of us, there's lots of ideas on the, the, the bank there, mm -hmm. and I fluctuate between these ideas of objects within landscapes, and then actually maybe the more subtleties, which are, you know, which we actually see within the actual scenes, um, and also some of the colours which I can replicate within the actual bowls. Um, my method of finishing is is created through what's known as a wood kiln which was commonplace probably up until um, most, most pottery was actually found in sort of like wood kilns up to about the 1920s. Um, with the advent of war um, and the, the increase of technology, we swapped to sort of fossil fuels basically, so to sort of like to coal, um, to sort of like to, to uh, oil, to gas. So the actual wood kilns became kind of like massively redundant um, especially after the Second World War, um, the, the, the biggest kind of like, uh, the biggest uh, wood firing sort of centre of Europe, uh, which is in a place called Le Bourne in Burgundy, that kind of like closed its kind of like, you know, its factories for the last time and all its wood kilns. Since then, um, wood firing has actually been picked up by kind of what you would call probably like artist potters, um, exploring like the old, the old crafts, uh, which are particularly difficult. But you get kind of like really interesting, very unusual sort of results with sort of like the wood kiln. The wood kiln itself produces the, all the colours. Um, you don't have to put anything within your clay and you will actually have uh, the flame and the wood ash within the kiln settled on your pot and create your, your colours. So there's various um, areas here, like I suppose I could talk about this, this form here, that the actual clay itself will always consist of sort of like a certain amount of ions and a certain amount of minerals within it. So if you actually expose it to the actual flame, the flame will move over it, will sort of like, will move in a certain direction, um, sort of wave through it, and it will deposit a certain amount of ash on the surfaces. And this ash kind of like fluxes around about sort of like 1280 degrees, sort of white hot, hot temperatures, and it starts to melt, so it starts producing a glaze in itself. So there's sort of certain hues sort of start to develop. At the same time, you're also getting a lot of carbon passing through the kiln, a lot of soot passing through the kiln, which will also settle, and which will also patinate. So depending upon the different layers of sort of glazes and the different types of um, sort of materials within those glazes, you can start to kind of like know that you can produce different tones. So when you put down all these white kind of like these these white layers of glazes because that's what they look like, you know through your experimentation you know that you are going to get a certain tone in a certain way. So it's not all by chance. There, there is a certain amount of uh, control and, and knowledge within that. At the same time, I, I tend to sort of like fire up to about thirteen hundred and twenty degrees, which is um, usually in conventional kilns you melt them. Um, so I'm ju I've just got a kiln which is just basically filled with heavy bricks, heating it with wood over usually a period of 62 or 72 hours. And in the last sort of like 24 hours, I'm actually hitting that white heat consistently. And at that sort of temperature, all of the work will be white hot. So it's literally on the verge of collapsing and warping and moving. And I find this really quite fascinating because it's just this, this element of where the, the pot is either completely ruined or otherwise it's sort of like alive and you're sort of like given this sustain and you're, you're walking this sort of knife edge where it's either a complete load of crap or you know it's a complete success and I, lo I love that that sort of that tension between the, the forms and at the same time you're actually operating at that white heat it softens the form and the form becomes kind of like almost it starts to live a little bit instead of coming out looking rather stiff and awkward like a lot of conventional kilns do. So, yeah, that's sort of like uh, allowing, allowing the work to have that idea of the, uh, the heat and the flame and that sort of, it sort of living that sort of life seems something quite uh, primordial, sort of something quite taking you right back to the beginnings of time, um, where I think, you know, yeah, the, the allowing the clay to sort of like reenact something which is, you know, millions and millions of years old, or how this planet sort of evolved. I sort of that quite fascinated with that sort of concept. Mm. So it's so interesting how you can have a a similar process and 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 create very different things. 
um, yeah. the, the surfaces, yeah. Yeah. the, the yeah. sort of yeah. materiality of them, the yeah. presence of them. Because yeah. the, these um, wood burners yeah, <laughs> at the front, they, 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 yeah. they look so fragile. They look like they're just, they could disintegrate into a pile of yeah. ash. Yeah. Rust yeah. or ash. Oh, or ash. Uh, at any, at any second. Yeah. Uh, but th these are quite strong. They're like a shield. They're like, if yeah. you, if you held yeah. one in front of you, you'd be yeah. safe. And then, and then, and then the parts, uh, well, sure. Firing processes, but, actually. Yes. Yeah. But, but yeah, there, there is, yeah, there, there are massive uh, variety of sort of like, uh, qualities or outcomes you can get from different kilns, different mm. temperatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 completely. So I mean, I've gone, I've gone through, um, <laughs> I suppose it was like, it was when I was 17 and going to art college, I sort of like picked up a book and there was this fantastic colour on this book, this, this, this ceramics book, it was this beautiful orange colour. Mm. And I sort of like, I looked through the book and I, I, I I didn't read the book, like, you know, you, most of you know I'm dyslexic, so I didn't read anything, I just looked at pictures, and that's why I just want those colour. <laughs> and so I was kind of like, and it, it was like, and, I, and then I saw other pictures of, in the book of kilns, and I thought, oh, I suppose then I've got to make one of these. <laughs> I didn't read that. And um, I, I had a bicycle at the time, but then I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't driving. And I had some panniers on the back of the bike, and I can like went down to the ceramic department and I nicked a load of bricks. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew that's what I needed. <laughs> I went back to the canyons and I sort of cycled five miles home. Oh my god! I was living in just outside Bangor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I put that together and then I went and scavenged um, the bricks on building sites and I built a kiln. Mm. And all I, I, the bricks. And yeah, all the no house bricks. Yeah. So I had sort of insulation bricks for the the actual kiln where the pots were, and then I just and I just house bricks the rest of it okay so you were protecting them from the so heat. I was protecting it yeah, yeah from the heat so put these pots in and for the first three fires and I scavenge all the wood and for the first three or four fires everything blew up everything you know but it was just mm -hmm. this whole fascination mm -hmm. of building this fire <laughs> for me you really remember putting an asbestos kind of like tube on the chimney it wasn't kind of like it wasn't it wasn't kind of like going up in heat and I needed, I thought, bigger chimney, big, more dry. <laughs> <laughs> I put it on the chimney and it blew up in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so my lungs, you know, and, and all these sort of, uh, I don't know, all these antics which actually came from it um, and all the local vandal, um, vandals which used to kick down the kiln every kind of like Saturday night, you know, after mm. a few beer cans, you know, and then they'd come up the following day and have to rebuild the kiln. Yeah, so this sort of labour of love which kind of carried on and just this fascination with sort of like fire. And over the years, I've built loads of kilns, you know, loads and loads of kilns. So uh, all different types of kilns. And the kiln which we've got at the moment is actually, um, it took about sort of like a, a year, well, probably about sort of like sort of eight months to build. And it didn't work. So I had to readjust it and took half of it down. Readjust it, took half of it down. Three times adjusting it, didn't work. Lost half, took it down. Mm -hmm. All of it took it down. So about a year, 14 months kind of like of waste of building. I like building too. I mean, I build as much of bricks, you know, bricks are like, it's, it's kind of great, you know. I had a tennis elbow and all the rest of it, and it was all kind of like. And then I put my one, one last thought together and I sort of like built the final kiln with the final other adjustments and just some rationale, but I just really rushed it through and pushed it, and the kiln worked. So I've got this kiln which actually kind of like is probably, there is no documentation of actually anything. <laughs> smaller of the type which is on record at the moment so it's quite an interesting kind of like scenario uh, but as time goes past you never really kind of like document these things things very well uh, does need documenting but you know I've got this very I've got this very unique machine a very small unique machine which can produce very um, unusual very sensitive and very varying kind of like marks <laughs> Yeah. Did you remember the orange though? <laughs> I did do the orange. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we did take a while. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Simon.